people. Um, I just, I just want to say, you know, can we, can we all get along? Can we, can we get along? It's not gonna change anything. We've got to quit. We've got to quit. We want to send a message to this community. The hoodlums out. Can we can we all get along? Can we can we get along? It's not gonna change anything. We've got to quit. We've got to quit. We want to send a message to this community. The hoodlums out there are not going to be able to terrorize this city. Today in Los Angeles, hundreds of people from all over the community are coming out with brooms in their hands. Calmer tempers lead to cleanup as the National Guard finally sweeps in. They will return fire. They will protect uh, innocent bystanders. But the anger has thundered across the country. There's a revolution going on. Just chill, y'all, chill! In San Francisco, in Atlanta, and even as far as New York. It is clear that a dangerous and difficult situation remains. Come right over here. See that fire over there? Tonight, CBS News takes you beyond the rage. These guys are local guys. They live here, and they're helping us with the fire. The heroes, the cops. So this is turning into a war. Uh, it's eerie. In 20 years, I've never seen like anything like this. The victims. The future. We're all human beings. We need to be treated like human beings. And they definitely were not treating him like human beings. And Los Angeles waits in the eye of the storm. Look at what they're doing. They're destroyed in the whole city. They're destroyed in America. This is a CBS News special report. Beyond the Rage. From CBS News headquarters in New York, here is Dan Rather. Good evening. Tonight, Los Angeles, and indeed the nation, may be at a turning point. Two days after the Rodney King verdict, two days after emotions erupted in the streets, there are signs that the city and our nation are struggling to reach beyond the rage. President Bush is due to address the nation in an hour. After some delay, he has ordered thousands of regular Army troops and some additional federal officers to Los Angeles to be on standby. After some delay, the Justice Department announced late today that it will finally open a grand jury investigation into the beating to determine if Rodney King's civil rights were violated. And for the first time since the verdict, the world heard from Rodney King. Now, we're used to reading, hearing, and seeing news in headlines and sound bites. But tonight, we wanted you to hear everything that Rodney King had to say as he issued a plea for peace. Uh, people, I, um, I just, I just want to say, you know, can we, can we all get along? Can we, can we get along? Um, can we stop making it, making it horrible for, for the, for the older people and. And the, and, the, and the kids, and I mean, we've got enough smog here in Los Angeles, um, let alone to uh, d deal with the uh, setting these fires and, and things. It's, it's, it's just not right. It's not right, and um, it's not it's not gonna it's not gonna change anything. Um, We'll, we'll get our justice. Uh, they've won the battle, but they haven't won the war. We, we'll have our day in court, and that's all we want. And just, uh, I, I love, I, you know, I'm, I'm neutral. I love every, I love people of color. You know, I'm, I'm not a, not like they, 
picking me out, picking me out to be. Um, we've got to, we've got to quit. We've got to quit. You know, after all, I mean, I can understand the the, the first upset for the first two hours after the verdict, but uh, to go on, to keep going on like like this, and to see the security guard shot on the on the ground, it um. It's it's uh, it's just not right. It's just not right because those people are, are, will never go home to to their families again. And uh, I mean, please, we can we can get along here. We we all can get along. We just gotta just gotta you know. I mean, we're all stuck here for a while. Let's you know let's 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 try to work it out. Let's try to beat it. You know, let's try and work it out. Rodney King late today. Now, for the latest on what's going on, we go live to veteran CBS News correspondent Richard Roth, standing by in Los Angeles. Richard, good evening. Good evening, Dan. The worst of the rioting here does seem to be over, but security on the streets is still a sometimes affair. There were shots exchanged today between police and a gunman carrying an automatic rifle. There has been more looting. A thousand federal law enforcement agents have been sent to work here, and 4,000 federal troops have been put on standby. Rush hour in Los Angeles never happened today. In daylight, the smoke from overnight fires was a shroud over neighborhoods blackened by arson. But new fires today were fewer. Authorities said the nighttime curfew had some success curtailing the violence. National Guard troops deployed yesterday were put to work protecting property. But in places where soldiers and police had come too late or not at all, in daylight today, there was despair. I don't understand this. I mean, this unbelievable, inhumane things happen. This owner of this store, uh, Buddy and Betty, they are good people. They have been good to my mother and my father. They, they, it's just ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. Just forget it. Authorities today put the casualty count at 37 dead, more than 1,300 injured. More than 3,000 people have been arrested, and early estimates of property damage topped $200 million. The governor called it terrorism and mobilized 2,000 more National Guard troops. We are taking no chance. We intend to have not just a show of strength, but actual strength. There's worry now that disabled public services will put a new strain on tempers just barely under control. With mail delivery suspended in the riot area, crowds came to a post office to collect welfare and social security checks. Postal officials said it made the best of a bad situation. A long wait in line, better than a weekend without cash. But banks were also jammed, as were food stores that hadn't been looted. There are neighborhoods without electric power and public transit. In short, the aftermath of violence has become a new challenge to discipline. So we got to go out and, um, you know, ask people to now start rebuilding. Magic Johnson today was among those responding to a call for L.A.'s famous to start a chorus for urban peace. We here join our community leaders who are asking for peace on the streets, calm in our neighborhoods, and an all-out citywide effort to heal and rebuild Los Angeles and the United States. Meantime, the curfew that last night helped to keep things quieter here is back in effect tonight. Dan? In Los Angeles, as Richard Roth reported, the latest figures indicate more than 1,300 persons hurt, dozens killed, the last official figure was 37, countless lives shattered and jobs lost, but numbers cannot tell the whole story. Behind the cold statistics are faces and families. Just who are the victims of the violence? CBS News correspondent John Blackstone found some answers. Three days of disorder have left at least 37 people dead. More now than died in the Watts riots of 1965. Some of the first victims were white motorists caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. But as the authorities begin to take back the streets, more and more of the dead are black, many dying in encounters with police. At least 1,300 people have been injured, a situation threatening to overwhelm hospital emergency rooms. But the wounds of the violence here are not just physical. On one city block, the hopes and dreams that are so much a part of American life have been destroyed. That was all my savings. All my life is gone. This is it. I have to start all over again. 
Ramin Brukin immigrated here from Iran six years ago. With his brother Kambiz, he opened an electronics store. This was full of games. On the left side, we have all kinds of stereos. They were on their way up until yesterday. What's going to happen here? What am I supposed to do as an owner? What am I supposed to do with my employees? Uh, is there anybody here to you know, give me a phone number which is not busy? What happened here had nothing to do with race, and this one block is the Los Angeles melting pot. The electronics store owned by Iranian immigrants, Lupita Bakery, Hispanic, a black-run bookstore, and down at the end, a furniture shop owned by Koreans. This was a pretty dangerous neighborhood you no. decided to set up business in originally, though. No, no, not really, not really. People are decent, you know, they, we all help each other, you know. They are decent people. But just before midnight last night, someone smashed through the doors and emptied the Lee family's furniture store. They are stealing, looting, and the shooting. This is not the USA. We can make this society a lot better. Most of the rest of this block of Pico Boulevard near downtown Los Angeles had already been torched. The bookstore wasn't looted, but it burned down when someone set fire to the shoe store beside it. Ellie Green was the manager. You know, they weren't interested in stealing the works of Malcolm X or Carlos Fonseca or the FMLN. They were interested in stealing some shoes. This is against us. Our conditions of life are, are now going to be uh, you know, quantitatively different. You, know, you can't you know, community destroyed. Communities destroyed. The bakery is a loss for everyone in the community. People came from miles around to buy bread and cakes here. It provided jobs for 40 people. Until yesterday, Jose Aguira worked here decorating cakes. And when you look in the window and see a cake that you decorated to give hope and joy to people. Yeah. I work for the people, you know, for his body, for his birthdays, for his weddings. I work. And now, I'm going to look for something else. Citywide, damage totals may be counted in the hundreds of millions of dollars. But that doesn't measure much of what was lost in one block of Pico Boulevard. So many hopes and dreams and ambitions. John Blackstone, CBS News, Los Angeles. Families across America are finding it harder and harder to stick together. And that's particularly true for African-American families. We'll take a closer look when we return, so stay with us. A year ago... We Americans were cheering the troops on their Desert Storm victory. Those American soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, and Coast Guardmen, you will recall, were black and white and Hispanic and Asian and from many other ethnic backgrounds. A true people's army, the U.S. Army, a proud patchwork of races that makes up this country. There was a rare unity in the U.S. then, but Randall Pinkston takes a look behind that moment to what everyday life is for most black families in America. Ten thirty-five this morning, a baby boy greeted the world at Washington's Greater Southeast Community Hospital. He was born a healthy six pounds, ten ounces to loving, successful parents. But for most black male babies, the deck is stacked against them from day one. Black males are twice as likely as whites to die as infants. Blacks are twice as likely to live in poverty. Black children are three times as likely to live in a single-parent household, probably headed by the mother. Javon Edwards is one of those children. His mother, Annette, is a single parent with four children. She is divorced, depending on public assistance for support. While hopeful, she knows what her son faces. Chances of not being able to find a productive job because of a lack of education, fairly high. How are you going to... What, what are you going to do? Just hope and you don't turn off for the worst. That's all. In a real sense, much of what happens to her and her children is out of her control. Well, I'm not saying they're going to say they not going to get in trouble or nothing like that. But I'm just praying that I'm praying for their they life. The future. The future for many black children means unemployment. Twice as many black males are jobless as whites. Ronald Harrison grew up in the same housing development where little Javon lives now. 
He has children of his own and remembers the temptation of taking the easy way out of joblessness. You must have been pretty depressed uh, yes. about, about that. It was hard to keep straight. You mean not get into trouble to make money to feed your family? Right, right. Hard, hard not to just say, well, I'm just going to make me some money any way I can. Most black men, like a street vendor named Bill we met in downtown Washington, beat the odds and find work and find a way to stay out of trouble. They understand and share the anger and frustration against a criminal justice system that does not seem to provide equal results. But Bill thinks the violence in Los Angeles may result in stacking the deck even higher against blacks. No, I don't believe in rioting. I don't, I don't believe violence solves anything. It just makes it worse. I believe a lot of blacks through this riot will, will lose even more jobs. And people won't even have, won't, really now won't, won't have them further. They'd be afraid of them. And anyone who wants to reinforce the fear can point to the fact that one in five black men in their 20s is either in prison, on probation, or on parole. But the Rodney King beating and verdict seem to reinforce a feeling among blacks that the system views black life as worthless, a message this brand new black child may have to live with all the days of his life. Randall Pinkston, CBS News, Washington. In his moving statement late today, Rodney King appealed to everyone to stop the violence, and he was mindful of the impact on a special group. He said, and I quote, people, can we all get along? Can we stop making it horrible for the older people and the kids? The kids, the future. Harry Smith, my colleague from CBS this morning, talked to the kids in one New York City school today as they returned from a rally. teachers saying what what's going on in your classes well, um, there was a walkout and what happened was half the school walked out the point is that it, what happened with Rodney King it, it doesn't make no sense to me they treating black people like with dogs you know like we can't get nowhere and we are angry yeah. and we are sick of being treated like that because it, it's, it's not just LA it's New York it's, yes. it's Chicago it's Detroit it's every it's everywhere those people in LA they're sick of that now, and they want to act out how they feel. Yep. And it's a shame that they don't know any better, anything better than, than, than violence. But then it's also a shame that our justice system is rigged so that it's a double standard for African Americans. Do you think there's a double standard? Do you think there's a, uh, a, a standard of justice yes. for black yes. people, yes. a standard of justice yes. for white yes. people? Yes. There is a double, there's a, you yes. think it's a double standard? Yes. Yes. If, if it was black cops that were beating on a Caucasian man, they all would have been yes. guilty. Yes. They they would have been. Been. Some people have suggested that this this should be a wake up call for America, for white America, for black America, for brown America, yellow America, enough, whatever. We as a people can only be tolerant for so long. And injustice after injustice is hard for for us to tolerate. And if it hits here, everybody better wake up. Because once it once it hits New York, everything's gonna be over. Let me ask you another question. Is anybody here, do you think, you think that the violence is justified? People have been saying, decrying the violence and saying, this is, this is bad, you're only hurting yourself. What, what's your own reaction? Is, we're only hurting ourselves because people don't realize that violence is not going to get us anywhere. We will still be in the same place that we were from the beginning. You know, I, I, want, I want something positive, but how can you tell somebody who's lived in, in, in a negative environment all their life to turn to something positive and go and march and not loot their own neighborhoods because they feel that they're worth nothing. Right, right. And they're told by the system that they're worth nothing. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? This is this whole no. tinderbox of feelings okay. that's erupting now. Uh, uh, to tell you the What's truth, it, is it going to be better five years from now? Maybe. Okay, it depends on what we do. This is our town. And we gotta make a difference, and we gotta make this town as good as we can. And if, if you let things like that happen here, then it, then this town's gonna go all the way down the drain. We're already going down the drain. We need to pull ourselves back out. We need to give peace a chance. Yes. What's up, Joe? Coming up next, 
What about the police? Good cops everywhere trying to do a good job. The view from behind the badge, how the verdict and its aftermath has affected some police officers. You've probably heard about it. It isn't written down anywhere, though. But there is a strict code among police officers because of their belief that they and only they know what it's like, what it's really like out there when you're dressed in blue. It's a code of silence. One cop just doesn't tell on another cop no matter what. But the Rodney King affair may be changing that. 48 Hours correspondent Harold Dow reports from the streets of Newark, New Jersey. July 1967, Newark, New Jersey. The riots left 26 dead, $10 million in property damage. 25 years ago, Sergeant Ronald Parm wasn't on the force yet, but he, like other citizens of this community, remember the death and the damage left behind. At one time, you had a major supermarket on this corner. This is also the area where back in 1967, you had the riots. You were standing basically in the heart of the riot area. And on some of the footage from 1967, you will actually see these buildings being shot at and the bullets ricocheting off the building. So when you look at uh, what's going on in Los Angeles, uh, when you saw the reaction from the verdict, when you actually saw the beating footage itself, what thoughts went through your mind? Well, I was appalled. I, as a person first, looked at the film and said that this is unnecessary. As a police officer, I'm feeling another way. I'm saying, here is something that could ruin the reputation and credibility of all police officers. Events in Los Angeles do seem far away from today's Newark. Most of this city's scars have healed. Still, there was no code of silence among Newark police officers. There was a petition to protest both the beating and the verdict. The men and women in blue didn't hesitate to sign their names and speak their minds. You see something like that? How can you find I'm not guilty? Yeah. No need for that. Sometimes you have to use force, you use what you have to use, and that's about it. But you don't go that far. This is just one isolated incident, and all police officers aren't like that. William Celester, Newark Police Director. If the beating would have occurred under your command, by some officers under your command, what would your reaction have been? What would you have done? I would have been arrested. In 1967, about 15 percent of Newark's police department was black. Today, that number has more than doubled. Some things have changed, some things have not. We've lived through a riot. We have a PhD in rioting. Sharp James is the mayor of Newark. Is when you see what's going on in Los Angeles and in other cities across this country, what thoughts go through your mind? To see buildings being burned and looting, we know from our prior experience here in the city of Newark that those buildings will not be replaced in years to come, decades. We still have those scars. We still have the poor image from the rioting of 67. It takes decades to even bring grass up in those lots again. The underlying problems, says Mayor James, were never solved. And until this country recognized that racism is as healthy and alive and well, it is fundamental as motherhood and apple pie in America, we'll never address it, we'll never cure it. A special commission looking into the 60s riots summed it up this way. This is where we are today, black and white, suburban and urban, rich and poor, fighting one another, and it's a shame of America. Tragically, these words from 25 years ago apply today. Some things have changed, some things have not. Dan, what has changed is that some police officers are now speaking out against their own. They're putting it on the record that there are indeed some police actions that they simply will not support. Held down. Thanks. A police officer has an altercation with a citizen. The community explodes. It's not Los Angeles today, but the Miami area a few years back, and there are lessons there to be learned. Juan Vasquez reports. During the 1980s, Miami was the nation's flashpoint for urban rioting. Here, the Rodney King scenario is all too familiar. The first time it happened, a group of white policemen stopped a black businessman named Arthur McDuffie, who was riding a motorcycle. 
Police said he resisted arrest, and McDuffie was beaten to death with flashlights. The police were charged with murder and manslaughter, but the trial was moved to another city. When they were acquitted, Miami exploded. The first riots left 18 dead, but there would be more. At least three more times during the 80s, police shootings and beatings of black and Puerto Rican victims sparked riots. Liberty City, Miami's black ghetto, earned a place in the headlines and in the history books as the site of repeated riots. Miami was a city full of racial anger and frustration. I used to hear police officers talking to each other about an NHI. And one day I became lawyer for the Metro Dade Police Department, and they finally clued me in that when a black person is a victim of a crime, they call it NHI because there's no human involved. Eventually, slowly, changes came, starting with the naming of a black police chief. Calvin Ross is the third consecutive black to head the department. City police today undergo sensitivity training. The city has started to require that an officer live in the area he patrols, and it uses so-called salt and pepper patrols that combine officers of different ethnic backgrounds. Miami Mayor Xavier Suarez says, you get points just for trying. From my own experience and in my own uh, situations, the one thing that I can say that helps a lot is to be out there. You know, just go out in the community and talk to people. Today, the city is quick to respond to black complaints that once would have gone unheeded. We are just one chokehold away from being L.A. today. When black leaders complained to the city council yesterday about the use of a police chokehold that has left a black man comatose, the council immediately ordered a temporary halt to the use of the controversial tactic. Black leaders say the riots have taught everyone some hard lessons. Black Miami has matured to understand riots destroy our communities, kill us, put us in jail, have our insurance rates go sky high. We have no more political power than we had before, no more economic power before. But racial tensions haven't disappeared. Liberty City suffers from all the woes that afflict black America. Poverty, unemployment, drug use, the lack of political power. And later this year, Miami could face another racial test. Three years ago, on the eve of the Super Bowl in Miami, police officer William Lozano shot and killed a black motorcyclist who was being chased for a traffic violation. That touched off yet another riot. The accused officer was tried in Miami and convicted. But after an appeal, the court ordered a new trial in a different city because of the emotional atmosphere in Miami. Black leaders fear what might happen if he's acquitted the second time around. That's when they'll find out how much Miami has changed, how much Miami has learned. Juan Vasquez, CBS News, Miami. Who and what turned Los Angeles into a free fire zone, wrecking a great city and its reputation? When we return. continues. From New York, here again is Dan Rather. Welcome back. After two fiery days and nights, Los Angeles faces the first weekend since the Rodney King verdict. The city is edgy, nervous. President Bush has put thousands of regular Army troops and additional federal officers on standby near Los Angeles, ready now to help the police and National Guardsmen if that becomes necessary. The president is to address the nation in about a half hour. We will cover that live. This program will lead up to it. Meanwhile, another curfew is about to go into effect. Some parts of Los Angeles have been called, and with reason, a war zone, deadly and dangerous. And much of the blame for that belongs to weapons that are more appropriate for a real war zone than a city neighborhood. Correspondent Jerry Bowen tells us about them. The signature image of the Los Angeles riots is firepower, shotgun-toting police to heavily armed merchants, and the weapons against them. What kind of weapons are against you? Well, you heard the AK-47 picked off the firemen uh, the first day of this thing, and the AK-47 damn near uh, critically injured or could have critically injured those policemen, in fact, killed them outright. Just this morning, three Los Angeles policemen were wounded when a sniper opened fire with an AK-47. The sniper was also shot and captured. For Los Angeles police homicide detective Don Tabak, it was the start of another day in the combat zone. What can an AK-47 do? I'm not a gun expert, but I'll tell you, I understand it can go through those car uh, bodies like it's butter. Um, it can go through a big rig like it's butter. It's a, it's a killing weapon. 
they use them in wars in other countries. So this is turning into a war. But the main weapon of this war, the real firepower, is fire. Thousands of fires, mostly businesses set by arsons. And like the case Detective Tabak and his partner were working today, a body found in a burned out building, fires ignited by gasoline bombs, Molotov cocktails. You can tell it's a, a body, but you can't tell whether it's male, female, age, nothing. He's kind of curled up in a fetal position underneath the desk. The owner saw the uh, place burning on TV after he closed it up. Common sense would tell you that it possibly, if it's not an employee or somebody else, then it's either a burglar or a looter. Investigators say the victim may have been caught in a fire of his or her own making. Another arson incident in a city where there have been far too many fires for firefighters to deal with. And even with protection, often too much risk for anyone to remain at a riot scene. Do you feel in danger? Are you in danger here? I would imagine the badge is in danger. Well, yeah, maybe I am. But you look around, these look like the neighbors. This is the neighborhood. Who's the enemy? You know, they don't wear big things as the enemy. We do, you know, but uh, they don't. This is called the Great Equalizer. <laughs> it is out of the sense of fear and frustration that some people are taking matters and weapons into their own hands. Firepower begetting firepower. You say enough's enough. Well, you do it yourself. It's your city. This is the first time in my entire life that I've really been scared about protecting my family. And I've had it. Handle the looters and... Even with more than 3,000 rioters arrested so far, even with a nighttime curfew in force, smoke is still heavy in the air over this city. For yet another night, the signature image of Los Angeles is firepower. Jerry Bowen, CBS News, Los Angeles. It's been 48 hours plus since the verdict. Two days that have had their share of villains and villainy. You've heard a lot about that. But there's been the other less reported, underreported side of the story, the story of the heroes and their heroics. When I looked on television and I saw the violence, immediately I made a decision to go down there to do what I could to help. This particular uh, Spanish fellow came through on his way home they jerked him out of his car. They began to beat him, and I was trying my best to, to, uh, to help him out, to defend him. Reverend Benny Newton defended a man he did not know against a mob of 20 vicious young men. And then this one young man picked up a large a speaker, uh, uh, and he took the speaker and lifted it above his head and came down on Mr. Lopez's head, and when he did that, I, I, I covered him with my body. I literally covered him with my body, and I told them, you're going to have to kill me, too. Reverend Benny Newton saved Fidel Lopez's life because he wanted to help out. A lot of brave people feel that way. I mean, you see it on the news, everybody's wanting uh, to help out. Today, after two nights of rioting, a lot of people came out and went into the middle of this raging war. They came to save lives. They came to save buildings. Uh, it's been real good. We put out a building over there, and we're putting this one out, and we saved this one. Everybody's pulling together. I'm not even from this neighborhood. They came to save entire neighborhoods. You know, I think of people in the community, they come out, and they see more and more people getting active and actually cleaning up and trying to do as much as you can. I think you'll get more involved, man. Actor Edward James Olmos. I got on the air yesterday and told him that I was just going to go out with a broom in my hand. And basically what is happening right now is that the community youth gang services came up and joined me, and then all of a sudden uh, hundreds of people from all over the community are coming out with brooms in their hands. After all the destruction and death and fear, the one incident that's become perhaps the most haunting of them all, a young truck driver left for dead, lived. He lived, as his best friend told us, because two women came out and risked their lives to save his. But they sat there and said when they saw an innocent man being beat like that, they knew it was time for them to get in their car and do something about it. Heroes. In closing, over 130 years ago, Abraham Lincoln made history when he quoted the biblical book of Mark, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Lincoln was talking about slaves and masters. Generations later, slavery is no longer the issue, but the house is still divided, and we are still standing.
but we're still trying to stand for our children and our children's children. What was once a simple split between slave and master now isn't even just a split between black or white. America today is made up of many colors, many races and places. Lincoln's dream hasn't gotten any easier. But now, as in Lincoln's time, we're all in this together to do the best we can. Coming up next, the President's Address to the Nation, and later the CBS Friday Night Movie, The House on Sycamore Street. Dan Rather, thanks for joining us. Stay here now for the President's Address. Experience CBS News.